Okay. Okay. Good morning. Today we're doing flu part two or flu part two as, as Tim likes to call it. Um, Tim really, really covered like the basics of of viruses more generally. Uh, the last time we talked about flu. So today I'm gonna get into a little bit more about flu specifically, um, the influenza virus, as well as pandemics and, and zoonotic disease. So as a review, the virus is a submicroscopic infectious agent that replicates only inside the cell of a living organism. We know that viruses infect all life forms, but Tim talked a lot last time about whether or not we consider viruses actually to be a living organism themselves. Um, that's still very much up for debate. We won't really go any further than that. Um, they're very, very tiny. Tim showed this visual last time as well. This, this brown thing is a human hair um, and viruses are generally about the size of a virus. They're very, very small. They're uh, about um, 0.1 micrometers um, or smaller. Um, the Zika virus is not the smallest virus, but it is in this in this representation. Influenza kind of falls in between Zika and bacteriophages. Um, but they're very, very small. You can't really see them, obviously, with, with your naked eye, but under a, a normal microscope, they're not really visible. You need to see them under an electron microscope. Um, so, super tiny. And then there are different types of viruses, um, which can get very, very complicated since they're... The way we name viruses is, is a little bit different than how we name traditional uh, living species. It's very similar, but it's different, but they can be broadly classified into these four different types uh, where we have helical, polyhedral, spherical, and complex. And this is all based on the shape of the virus, but they're all made up of some form of genetic material, whether that's DNA or RNA um, and a capsid, which is essentially just like um, a protein layer. Influenza itself is a spherical virus. It's known as an orthomyxovirus, um, which again gets back into that, that how we classify and name viruses. Um, but it is a negative sense segmented RNA virus, meaning that it um, has this, this single-stranded RNA broken up into segments. It's not one, one long, entity. Um, it's composed of seven to eight different segments um, read backwards when it replicates. The way influenza infects host cells is it attaches through adhesion. Um, it's essentially engulfed by the cell um, and then releases its, its viral RNA, this negative, negative sense um, segmented RNA into the nucleus where it is replicated. Um, it then reforms and makes little baby viruses that bud off and are released back into the host. Flu is transmitted by three, through three different mechanisms, um, aerosols, and respiratory droplets, you're probably familiar with. They, they've been talked a lot about um, in terms of, of um, COVID, the virus that causes COVID-19. Um, aerosols are very small. They are usually produced by sneezing. They linger in the air for a lot longer, where respiratory droplets are essentially spit that you 
expel when you're coughing or you're talking, but they're larger, they're heavier. Um, they don't linger in the air as long. Fomites are intermediate objects that can carry virus particles. So when you release aerosols or respiratory droplets, um, or if you have virus like on your hand or something along those lines and you touch a surface, virus particles can linger on that surface and transmit the virus to someone else. Influenza can further be broken down into four different subtypes named very plainly just A, B, C, and D. And they're differentiated by which species they can infect and how many RNA segments they have. So influenza A and B viruses have eight of these segments um, and they primarily infect humans. C and D have seven. Um, C primarily infects humans asymptomatically. It's much more common in um, non-human hosts. And D is, is a relatively newer influenza that they they've know about. Um, it, and it's not known to cause disease in humans. We will primarily talk about influenza A and influenza B today, since those are the most common. Um, but the way we name influenza viruses is, is kind of complex. Um, you're probably familiar with, with the viral subtype that we talk about. This is generally how um, the media talks about uh, influenza specifically in terms of H, like H3N2, H1N1 is something you're probably familiar with, H5N1. Um, this is the viral subtype, and this is really um, just with influenza A. The longer name that we use to distinguish these viruses includes the virus type, so A, B, C, or D, its geographic origin, meaning where, not necessarily where the virus originated, but where it was originally isolated, um, its strain number, and then the year that it was isolated, and then following with the, the viral subtype. And we'll get into how we get this viral subtype in a bit. But flu virus, um, we know the most about influenza A. It infects a lot of different species, um, including humans, but it can also infect birds and mammals. Um, whereas influenza B, C, and D, we know a lot less about, um, but we know a few species that they can infect. We know with B, um, for example, seals and sea lions can, can be infected. Um, the research on that is still kind of unclear, but again, the most is known about, about influenza A, which is what we'll talk about first. Um, this is the subtype that's responsible for most seasonal epidemics as well as pandemics. And what's important about influenza A are these H and N proteins. These are receptor binding or receptor membrane proteins. Um, this is how the virus binds to your cells. Um, and we have hemagglutinin and neuraminidase. And this is how we get that H and subtype name. Um, there are 18 known H proteins and 11 known N proteins. There, of course, could be more, but it's really involved in the recognition of these different, the differences in the H and the N proteins are involved in the recognition of, of target host cells, as well as facilitating the movement of virus particles. So you'll get different presentations of the disease, you'll get different tissues that are infected um, as you move between the different, the different um, proteins. Influenza B is known to have a more limited host range, um, but it is circulating primarily in human populations. It's 
named primarily by its viral lineages. So we have the Victoria and the Yamagata lineage. Um, these are where they were originally isolated. There's not really that much more to know about influenza B. It's much less common. As we all know, we have flu season, um, meaning flu circulates through the population on a yearly cycle. Depending on which region you live in, um, flu season, the time of year that flu season occurs will vary. So for us in the Northern hemisphere, we usually get flu season between November and April with it peaking in February. Um, and the Southern hemisphere primarily the opposite. So April to November um, where it, and it can occur kind of year round in yellow. But as you can see, it kind of cycles through these peaks and valleys year to year. Um, and then we get different dominant influenza types year to year. Um, a question I hear very often is, is why is that? Why do we need to get vaccinated for flu every year? Why are there different um, viruses cycling? Why do we even have flu season? It's because of influenza's ability to evolve very rapidly due to something called antigenic drift. Antigenic drift is essentially mutate, mutations occurring in these hemagglutin and neuraminidase proteins. Um, very, very small changes, um, but it allows the virus to evade immune systems. And that's how we get like these different strain numbers. So we're not making big changes. We still have like an H1N1 virus, but the strain number might be slightly different. Um, and it's evolved in a way that it allows it to escape our immune system. And primarily what's circulating right now, these are actually the, um, the recommendations that I now can't remember the organization name, but there's a, a global governing body that, that monitors flu and makes recommendations um, for vaccines based on what's circulating, um, based on the lineages that are circulating, but we get um, this quadrivalent vaccine that contains a strain of H1N1, H3N2, as well as both of our, our lineages of influenza B. Um, you'll see this H1N1, both of these um, strains, have this H1N1 PDM09 like, meaning they originated from the uh, 2009 pandemic and have evolved um, into essentially different different strains, but they're still very much like that um, pandemic virus. So flu seasons versus flu pandemics. Like I, I was talking about flu season repeats every year uh, in this very predictable cycle. Um, and we know which viruses are circulating. Their strains are gonna be slightly different due to that antigenic drift. But we know influenza A and B are circulating primarily H1N1 and H3N2. Whereas with pandemics, it's primarily caused by influenza A viruses. They're very irregular and it's usually caused by a novel virus that spills over um, into the population and then spreads very rapidly. And so what do I mean exactly by like a novel virus and how do we get novel viruses? Novel viruses are essentially something that is new to a host that hasn't seen the virus before. So in most of these examples, it will be human. Um, and so because it is a new virus, that's why it can um, just like spread through the population like, like wildfire because we don't really have immunity to it because we've never seen it before. Our immune system has never seen it before. Um, 
But we get these, these novel viruses through these mechanisms, like I talked about antigenic drift, but also antigenic shift. Um, antigenic shift is a little more, more complicated. It's very much large changes to our genetic structure of a virus. Um, whereas with drift, we see those small changes that allows the virus to escape our immune response. Um, but it's really, it's really the same virus. We can expect an H1N1 virus that's undergoing antigenic drift to still stay an H1N1 virus. Um, its subtype must might just be, or like its strain number might just be a little bit different. Where shift creates new genetic se segments, which generate new viral subtypes. Um, and this happens in a way that will, will be explained later. Um, but this is how we get pandemics. These major changes allow the virus to more effectively evade immune systems, um, meaning we're encountering this novel virus that we've never seen before. It spreads very rapidly, and a lot of people can get really sick from it. In the past century, there have been four major influenza pandemics in humans. We have the 1918, which is probably one that you are more familiar with. Um, this is the, the great influenza or, or the Spanish flu. Um, we also had a pandemic in 1957. This was called the Asian flu. Uh, and again, in 1968 with the Hong Kong flu. And then most recently in 2009 with swine flu. Uh, 1918 was a huge pandemic. It's estimated, we don't have great data on this, but it's estimated that about 500 million people were infected, which is at the time about a third of the population. And there were around 50 million deaths. But lost my train of thought. Um, why it was called the Spanish flu, the Spanish flu is a misnomer. Um, the earliest cases were reported in Kansas. It's really, really unclear, um, even based on research that's been done more recently, where the virus originated. But because this, this pandemic was occurring during World War I, a lot of countries were censoring or suppressing bad news to keep morale high. Um, where Spain was a neutral country, and so they were reporting very freely on the outbreak, which created this false impression that Spain was the epicenter. Um, but really, it, it's better to call it like the 1918 H1N1 pandemic or the Great Influenza. Um, but in 1956 and 1968, we had two separate pandemics. The first um, in 1957 was called the Asian flu. Um, it was first reported in China and it's estimated that where there were about one to 4 million deaths. What was really interesting about this pandemic it, is that it was caused by an H2N2 viral subtype, which is not a common viral strain. Um, there's not a lot more to say about that. Um, it's not really something that's that's circulating um, widely anymore, um, but of course it still has some pandemic potential. Um, and then in 1968, we had an H3N2 pandemic, which also had about one to 4 million deaths. Um, this was called the Hong Kong flu because it was first recorded in Hong Kong, but it's speculated that it started in mainland China. 2009, we had swine flu, which is our, our most recent pandemic memory, influenza pandemic memory. Um, this was an H1N1 virus, also known as swine flu. Case estimates are a very gross underestimate. Um, 
it's reported that there were 18,449 deaths. Um, but the WHO, the World Health Organization, estimates between 250,000 and 500,000 people die from flu annually. So it's very much a gross underestimate, uh, underestimate how many deaths there were. Case estimates are between 700 million to 1.4 billion. But again, gross, gross underestimate. How do we get pandemics from these novel viruses? We get novel viruses from mechanisms of, of evolution, antigenic drift, antigenic shift, but then the virus has to spill over. Which brings us to our first video. There are an estimated this many individual viruses on Earth. Luckily, there are only a little over a thousand virus strains known to infect humans, the majority of which come from other animals. They're part of a group called zoonotic diseases caused by bacteria, viruses, parasites, or fungi. And the one we're all focusing on now is the virus that causes COVID-19. And new ones can emerge at any time. Here's what needs to happen for a virus to jump from animals to humans. As a pathogen, the virus's goal is to infect its host and replicate, because it can't do that on its own. Let's say this pig is the original host of a virus. He and his buddies form a reservoir, a specific population of animals of the same species that naturally host a pathogen. So there are millions of viruses out there infecting animals, literally millions. I mean, the more we look, the more we find. And most of those viruses don't infect you know, other animals. They have a restricted host range. Most of the time, the virus doesn't affect its original host or only mildly affects it. So what's it doing in there? Suppose that this pig hosts a virus that primarily infects the gut. Viruses tend to attack different parts of the body, depending on whether they can bind to these guys. Receptors are proteins found along the outside of a cell, used to communicate with the rest of the body. But viruses can latch on too. Cells in a respiratory system may have different receptors than cells in a digestive tract. A virus does its thing by latching onto a host cell entering it or injecting bits of itself into it, and then hijacking it. It forces the cell to make copies of the virus, all of which will go on to hijack other host cells. This will usually kill the host cell. And if enough of the host cells are infected and make more of the virus, the host will contract an infection, which, if the body can't fight it off or fights too hard, could lead to severe disease or death. In reservoirs, however, the species has likely evolved a resistance to the virus over many generations. This allows a sort of equilibrium. The immune system controls the infection without killing the virus off completely. If the virus jumps, though, a new host won't have that same or any immunity. That might sound scary because, truthfully, you are constantly being exposed to viruses. But only a very small number succeed at infecting a new host species. It's called spillover, and there are a series of barriers that a virus must navigate for that to happen. If it's held up by even one of these, it can be stopped in its tracks. Simplified, they represent two things. Can the virus get to the new host cells, and can it bind and enter them? The more infected pigs there are in one space, and the closer they are to people, generally the more chance of spillover. But the likelihood also has to do with how the humans are interacting with them. Animal viruses are usually transmitted to people in a few ways. Contact with excretions, slaughter, bites, contact with tissues, or through an intermediate species like mosquitoes or ticks. So places like farms and slaughterhouses and even petting zoos, where people come in close contact with animals, have an increased risk of spillover. Proximity alone isn't enough, though. Some of it can be genetic for humans. There's a huge list of genes that have been associated with different risks of infections, some genes offering resistance to certain infections and others increasing risk. 
Beyond genes, the virus has to get through the body's innate immune responses. So there's two types of immune responses. One is the so-called adaptive immune responses. So those are antibodies and T cells, um, and they generally get stimulated after the infection has already occurred. The innate responses are the ones that are already present inside the cell that make an, a cell or a host you know, resistant to the virus. Unlike an adaptive response, an innate one can attempt to fight off any pathogen rather than a specific one. Mucous membranes, stomach acid, skin, sentinel cells, and even just a lack of the right receptors can stop a virus from infecting a person. So this is when mutations are really important. A successful spillover usually doesn't happen with the original virus. They have to gain some mutations that allow them to replicate most efficiently, um, allow them to overcome those host barriers. A virus that infects the digestive system of the pig might attack respiratory cells in humans. It depends on what receptor the virus is suited for or mutates to be suited for. Once inside the new host cell, an infection will only be successful if the virus can replicate. Typically, infected cells will release interferons, proteins that stop the virus from replicating within the cell and in nearby cells, which contain the infection and stop it from spreading to new cells. If that doesn't work, the adaptive immune system kicks in. Your T cells suss out and kill already infected cells to stop them from making more new virus, while your white blood cells pump out antibodies specifically tailored to fight this new pathogen. But because the body has never seen this virus before, it can take weeks to produce the right ones. And immunodeficiencies in either type of response can make it even easier for a virus to take hold. So if a virus gets through all that contact, infection, replication, then it has successfully spilled over. But the virus has to be able to transmit. It has to be able to be shed from that original person. Um, and it has to be able to infect, you know, at least one or two more additional people so that you can start a chain of transmission. A virus infecting two people has double the odds of going on to infect additional people compared to a virus infecting just one. And this can continue until it reaches epidemic and pandemic proportions. COVID-19 was certainly not the first zoonotic disease, and it won't be the last. Viruses don't want to kill their hosts. No host means no virus. But new diseases are so dangerous because humans don't have the same immunity as the virus's reservoir host. And because there are so many, it's currently not possible to predict when or what specific viruses will spill over. But we do know the conditions in which spillover can occur. You know, how and where they might occur and how we can put in place sort of better monitoring so that we can catch them early and, and as I say, stamp them out before they get to the point where they become sort of an out of control epidemic. There are an the flu is a zoonotic disease, meaning it is an infectious disease that's spread between animals and people. Um, and like the video I was talking about, it starts with a reservoir. A reservoir is a population of organisms or a specific environment in which the infectious pathogen naturally, li naturally lives and reproduces. It typically doesn't cause Definitely not severe symptoms in, in the reservoir population, um, but it rarely even causes like clear signs of an infection. From the reservoir, we can get spillover. So we have a reservoir population coming into contact with a novel host, meaning a host that has never seen this virus before, um, what we call naive. Um, because of, of certain gen genetic mutations, the virus might take hold in this population and just explode. Um, in flu, uh, this is where antigenic shift really comes into play. Uh, when, spillover, when a spillover event occurs, um, the virus can reassort and create a new strain in the pandemic or in which may lead to a pandemic. Uh, what I mean by reassort is when you get an infection um, in, in a, a novel host population or even 
even a typical host, um, if you get multiple infections, infecting the same cells, new vi viruses that, that are created um, from this hijacking of the, the cell, your cell's machinery, um, can take segments from each of these infections and combine them to create a new virus, which is what happened in 2009. Um, this was a spillover uh, event, or this is, I mean, this is what happened in, in 1957, 1968, and 2009. 2009 specifically was a triple reassortment between birds, pigs, and humans. So you get our classic H1N1, human seasonal H3N2, and then a North American avian um, influenza virus all combine within a host and take viral segments from each one. And you get this triple reassortment, um, which turned into H1N2, but then our European-like, um, our European avian-like H1N1 that was circulating um, then combines with this triple reassortment to create a pandemic version of H1N1. Which brings us to right now, we are currently in an outbreak um, of influenza. Right now it is H5N1, which is considered a bird flu. Um, this is highly pathogenic avian influenza. And it's caused a significant amount of deaths in the commercial poultry industry as well as in wild birds. Um, this is the CDC's report, how many birds have been affected, I believe just in the US, um, but there's only been one reported case in humans um, so far. H5N1 has, has historically not been great at getting into human populations, but we know it has really high pandemic potential. Um, and so we'll end on this video about why that may be. A farm like this is called a concentrated animal feeding operation, or CAFO. CAFOs are basically huge industrialized farming operations. They contain tens of thousands of animals, sometimes hundreds of thousands of animals, and they're often very crowded. American CAFOs were efficient and profitable, and soon they became a model for farming all over the world. Today, almost all the meat we eat comes from farms like this. Factory farms supply an estimated 90% of meat globally and around 99% of the meat we eat here in the U.S. So if you're eating a burger or bacon or whatever it is today, it probably came from a factory farm. A uh, CAFO is an environment built for one purpose, to house as many animals as possible. What worries scientists is that that also makes it an ideal environment for the pathogens that cause pandemics. A virus is really just a bit of genetic code that makes copies of itself. But that replication process isn't always perfect. They're introducing lots of mutations as they replicate. Martha Nelson studies viruses at the National Institutes of Health. Most of those mutations are going to be deleterious and you know, won't help the virus at all. Lots of mutations just lead to the virus dying. But occasionally, a mutation will happen that will give the virus a new ability to be more deadly, for example, or to be able to jump from one species to another. A virus can only replicate when it's inside another organism, a host. But it can only replicate inside a host for so long. Every host eventually dies. That means even if a virus does mutate in a beneficial way, without hosts, that mutation will eventually die out. And out in the wild, or even on a small farm, new hosts can be hard to come by. But in a CAFO... Let's say you're a pathogen. If you're on a factory farm, where you have hundreds of thousands of potential hosts. It's a bonanza. More hosts means more chances to replicate, more chances to mutate, and a higher likelihood that a mutated virus will survive. In other words, factory farms are also factories for new viruses that we haven't seen before. 
And that's also helped along by the larger system that capos are a part of. There's a lot of international trade going on of live animals. We're sending these animals from city to city and from country to country. We're flying them across oceans. Some viruses have a genetic code that's segmented into parts. And sometimes two of these viruses come into contact with each other. Occasionally, you can have two separate viruses co-infect a single cell. When they replicate, they can just kind of swap out entire segments with the other virus. And through that, you can kind of create these chimeric, you know, offspring that have pieces from the two parents. Just like with mutations, this swapping and shuffling of segments between viruses is basically random. And that means sometimes the new virus is a dud. But every now and then you hit jackpot and you come up with a radically new combination that has properties that neither of the two parents had. In CAFOs, viruses have an opportunity to come into contact with each other all the time. That's making it easier for a virus that exists over here on one side of the world that normally would just stay on that side of the world to travel quite quickly to another part of the world. With viruses from different parts of the world mixing and shuffling and mutating inside animals, humans have made it very easy for a nasty virus to emerge. And actually, it's happened already. We are continuing to closely monitor the emergency cases of the H1N1 flu virus. In 2009, a new virus quickly spread around the world. It became known as the swine flu because of its links to pig farms in North America. It came from the major swine production region that's right outside of Mexico City. That particular virus was able to evolve there because you have pigs coming from the United States over the border into Mexico. You have pigs from Europe. And so you have this sort of mixing bowl of pigs from all over the world that are able to share their viruses and exchange genetic components and create this really unusual pandemic variant. By the time public health measures and a vaccine were able to get it under control, swine flu had killed hundreds of thousands of people. So, as we saw, this has already happened. And so we think that there's great potential for H5N1 because of essentially this, where you have this mixing in very large commercial factory farms. Um, so you have a lot of potential, sorry, hair in my mouth. Um, you have a lot of potential for viruses to mutate and transmit. Um, and not only are these animals coming in contact with each other, they're coming in contact with the people that work there. And that's really where um, there's the greatest potential or spillover. Um, so I'll end, I'll end with, with a recommendation of, of my favorite book, um, one of my favorite books, uh, Spillover by David Quammen. Um, if you want to learn more about uh, animal infections and pandemic potentials, uh, this is a really great book. And he's a really fantastic science writer. This book was actually published in 2012. Um, but there is a chapter in here called Dinner at the Rat Farm on SARS, which is quite, quite spooky reading it, knowing what, what we know now. Um, so yeah, I'll stop sharing and...